line. So there's going to be a, now a very clear way of how you must work together in this study so that it doesn't become a pocket of studies coming in and doesn't make sense at the end of the day. In the structure, because they made quite a bit of a progress with the reconstruction project, uh, the Department of Culture decided that we would now establish the Research Institute for Traditional Structure. And uh, this will be an institute initially housed under the Ministry of Home and Cultural Affairs, but we would like it to be independent over the years, but not as of now, because I think if you already give independence, nobody would own it and we don't see it growing. And we are hoping that this institute will largely establish the know-how and technology um, for safe and sustainable traditional structure. And your focus is still on traditional because I think um, many of our craftsmen know the skill better and we want to continue using them. And I think kind of give them the pride that what they know contributes to the, the cultural um, richness of the country. So that's what we want to do. Um, with this research, uh, we have already started opening our doors to experts who are willing to work. And we are not only looking into experts, but we are also looking into students who are willing to take forward research. Uh, we only provide the platform. We will be providing platform in such a way that the resources are provided. There's uh, a conducive atmosphere to get these works going, research going. But the key thing is whatever work that is done must be left behind as to the institute so that there's a consistency in the follow-up research. Bhutan has seen many such small pockets of works being done, but they never link up together, you know. There are only small pockets which, of course, a lot of investments have gone in, particularly investments from World Bank, ADB, uh, huge amounts, but then eventually when you try to piece them together, they don't make much sense out of it. So we're hoping that this institute would eventually work towards it. If we get our bill uh, converted into an act by this summer, and then this certainly will come through. But even if it doesn't, knowing the political scenario, we had a backup. We applied for the Satreps project, which is a, a funded by the government of Japan. Um, after three attempts, uh, we finally managed to nail it. And we are now going to be starting this project coming next month. And uh, it's a five-year project. And uh, we will undertake material tests, micro -tremor measurements, static and dynamic tests. And we intend to eventually, at the end of all these tests, develop model for computer analysis and all that. We are hoping that uh, guideline, of course, it's a typical thing that we want to come, but we want to be able to train engineers and artisans in the country to be able to address this issue and challenges we have, and also develop simple assessment met method, because I think that's another challenge. The reason why our, uh, the insurance wouldn't insure on these buildings is all because we lack in that. So um, we uh, hope that through this project, which kickstarts from next month, we're able to do large scale tests as well as um, 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 determine at the end of the day what kind of reinforcement or intervention measures we must put on our traditional buildings so that they are resilient and they're safe for the people using it as well, but they do not distort the traditional architecture and the cultural value associated with these buildings also. So um, I'm, I, I, I really must mention that today's visit to the laboratory here, the structural laboratory that we got, uh, was quite uh, overwhelming for me because we're trying to make reaction frames and we're trying to make a strong floor back at home. We're trying to also put a shake table, which is two meter, and I think this would be uniaxial, not the biaxial that, that you have here. So um, considering how what I saw here, uh, I, I think we are quite worried how we're going to get it done to that position. So we're hoping that um, the RITS, of course, uh, will be an avenue where we can venture into more collaborations and also house and uh, students who are willing to undertake such a study and really take this forward from henceforth so that we feel that by undertaking this uh, study, then it's uh, the, the balance of structure and the architecture comes into play. And then even recognizing the cultural heritage value and trying to keep them, I believe that would be the key essence in making people understand what you have 
you must value it and you must undertake necessary intervention measures so that you're able to kind of protect and sustain them and keep it relevant to the society that comes forward. So that is all I wanted to share. I hope I didn't take much of your time. So I'm open for any questions if you, have, if you feel that I didn't address in my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we would like to open the floor for discussion. May I request a co convener of Intact Chennai Chapter, uh, architect Tara Murli, to please uh, come here, give her uh, comments after this wonderful lecture that we've had, and then open the floor for discussion. Please. Thank you. Please, this. First of all, let me thank you for what <clears throat> was really an excellent lecture and uh, <clears throat> worthy of uh, the fifth annual lecture of this series. <clears throat> um, few of the thoughts and comments that made to me, that came to me, I would just like, it's not an analysis of what you've given, but mostly with how I perceive um, what is heritage, what is its Unfortunately to me, heritage has become something which is very visual. And I think our problems start, start there. And you have actually, in the course of your lecture, you know, uh, talked about the various government departments which handle this, where exactly <coughs> your own uh, department is located in the Ministry of Culture. And I think these are very important aspects of those four legs that you showed because the aspect of good governance must be to give uh, heritage its location in culture but actually it's not only in culture but it's also in how these four legs interact with each other because culture is not specific it's it's based on environment it's based on good governance and it's based on you know people and uh, their needs so i would actually ask you how what is the flexibility that is required between these departments to make your work and to protect culture the second thing i would actually ask is we talk about culture as if it exists somewhere but to me actually culture is a right and it's the people's right. And I think we need to recognize it in that context of people's rights. We are today looking at it as somewhere as engineering solution, somewhere it's a bit of a, you know, a people's dream. You know, it's, it's an elitist, this thing. But actually, to me, it is the right of the people to want to, and it is the right of the state to see that it intervenes up to a level where this right is protected. And I'll give you a concrete example. <clears throat> Recently, uh, and this is the discussion that is going on between various um, uh, environment groups right now, is we all know about the Niamgari Hills, how the Gond uh, tribes looked at it, how they were able to defeat POSCO, and uh, POSCO, no, not POSCO, sorry, Vedanta. But today, the government is very subtly calling these, the, this organization which actually spearheaded that movement and got the, the tribal people to be able to express their, uh, <coughs> their uh, dissatisfaction with what was happening. They are today being termed as Maoists. And the moment they are called Maoists, it's very easy for the government, the state, to take a certain action against them. 
I really think we need to, we, we and this is very much in the area of culture. You talked about uh, Ne areas and the Niamgari Hills really typify what is the Ne area. It, there is no structure. The whole hill is their heritage. The whole hill is their God. It, the whole hill is also part of the environment. So there is a certain understanding and a link with, a holistic link with what we as human beings are. And I think here we are often seeing the state intervening in such things and trying to, you know, di di distinguish us from what we re see as our culture, which is a far more holistic um, situation. I also think much of this is happening because people are getting marginalized. And this whole development paradigm, I've been talking about this a few times, this development paradigm of investment, growth, you know, manufacture, which leads to communities getting disenfranchised, which leads to environment being degraded and destroyed. And we, we are all talking about material results. Is it sustainable? I mean, and you're talking about climate change. Recently, I was in Intac in um, Delhi, and uh, <clears throat> the material heritage was called to lay to actually talk about how to restore some of the wall murals in the Buddhist temples in Leh. And most of them were in mud construction. But with the impact of climate change, actually they are, the moisture content has increased so much that all these are actually falling off the, you know, the walls. So where do we draw this li line and link between our own actions or this development paradigm that is being pushed, which is also causing climate change and which is also destroying culture. I think these are very uh, sort of um, important questions. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was, you know, the very stark zong, I think it was, and then how embellishments had come into it. Um, I think there have been several um, writings about this, about what we perceive as a very stratified way of looking at culture in the West, where they actually prefer it to look old. But in the Asian, and I would definitely, I wouldn't go so far as to say Bhutan, but definitely in the Indian mind, renewal is part of this whole cultural thing. So we have this renewal of you know, 18 years, we redo our temples, we repaint them, maybe in more garish colors. But it is also a way of looking at the temple that we own it, and this is part of our own advancement. We don't look at it in the way that it has to be protected as it was earlier. I'm, I'm not saying I'm appreciative of the aesthetics of the new uh, the thing, but I think we should also understand how people look at it. I think. And if people value it, that is the best thing about it. Because in a sense, everything is actually, um, the whole idea of conservation is actually, it's virtual and not so much in the material. So um, the last two comments I'm going to make, I'm sorry if it's a little longer than what uh, you intended. I, uh, I, I don't know how it was pronounced, the Wang Due Fodra. Uh, I'm very scared about the interventions that have come in there because I see this as, as engineers applying their mind. It is an isolation of communities who have built it and it is not easily replicatable. You talked about all these things where governments or uh, the manufacturers gave you know, uh, uh, gave it free for this. It's nothing that people can, the next fire, the next this thing, nobody is going to look at it. This, this enthusiasm will not be there to restore it. <clears throat> Unless we can find the strength within the communities themselves to restore it, it doesn't matter. I also think that, you know, this thing of finding permanent solutions 
permanent, I mean, we all know it, uh, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. I don't think it is the best solution because there is a certain humility that things will happen. Maybe there will be another fire. Maybe you rebuild it again. It is that rebuilding and the thing that is more important than the prevention of fire. Because prevention of fire, the steps that are taken are actually going to isolate people from responding to the building as theirs. And I think that's very important. The last point I, I feel is, and I don't and I don't know what it is, it's actually that population is growing at this tremendous pace. And all over, you showed that first picture of the paddy fields and then the, uh, then the built area. I don't know how we can stop this because we can, because population is growing, obviously for, for many reasons, and we don't know how to stop it. And it is always going to make demands. And coupled with this uh, neoliberal, whatever it, uh, uh, paradigm of development, I don't know where we can ever find it. People are that, you know, maybe we are imagining it, but that contentment in less, is not going to be there. And I don't know how we are going to ever tackle this. Thank you. I can use this if that's all right. Uh, thank you, madam. I think um, how you summarize and the questions that you posed, I think um, this is, I think, what exactly we wanted to trigger out of this presentation because um, many of the questions that you had in mind, I think there, the, there's no answer to it. But if, if I can, of course, share some of my um, thoughts to some of these uh, issues raised. I think when it comes to incorporation of the actors, uh, particularly when we have these four pillars of GNH, the good governance, you're absolutely correct. They need to work together in hand. And where culture is placed, I think um, that's very important about how the government places importance on uh, protection of cultural heritage. And uh, in our case, in the last 15 years, and I was just sharing this to Dr. Arun Menon also, uh, we've been assessing how we are progressing. And I've realized that in the last five, uh, last three plan periods, which started from, um, I think, from uh, early 2000, what we have realized is that connection was lost in the process. We had a good development philosophy where it insists that every developmental programs have these incorporated but we've lost how to incorporate that in the last 15 years. And this time we are preparing the plan period for the next 12 five-year plan, which starts from July next to 2018. And we've taken up very seriously that we work towards incorporating that. We work exactly as you pointed out, placing where culture should stand in, in uh, collaboration with all these actors. So, <clears throat> What I, I feel that if it goes well as how we are proposing, uh, in the 12 five year plan, we are going to be, be seeing a flagship program, and that's when we will force all the collaborators to work together on one national project to really understand how we uh, collaborate together in delivering these projects. And probably our our uh, proposal as of now stands that it is on conservation, uh, not conservation, sustenance of cultural landscape. And that I think will also address this uh, problem that you mentioned about the in ever increasing population. How do we stop rural urban migration? How do we take development away from the capital city towards the uh, rural areas? How can we avoid government institutions to be crowded in the capital. I think they could easily function out of the capital city. If they move out of the capital city, I think the people who work in there would obviously make the, the other place more vibrant as compared to back in making everything more populated. So these are some <coughs> thoughts and discussions that are currently going on back in my country. And hopefully with the 12 five-year plan and this flagship program, we're hoping it addresses. 
Um, because we want to give uh, importance to culture in the context that we're able to well collaborate, we're also proposing uh, that the office that I work is uh, instituted as a commission, an autonomous agency with certain authority and uh, certain responsibility to bring in the collaborators together so that we could work. So probably if that comes through in another, I don't see it happening very soon because we are only lobbying the bill as of now. But if it happens in the next two years, I think then we can really see things changing from that perspective. The other question you uh, raised about the connection we have with our sites and how the state views it, I think that's a very difficult question, but it certainly is an issue back in our country also. And as I, I kept mentioning, um, the uh, now that we become a constitutional democratic country, I think um, there's a more say of these elected leaders, and they've really started to, you know, um, as you called it, marginalize and divide into how we see things. So that is also an issue, and how uh, we have a couple of challenges, but they tend to be uh, mm, uh, involving the monastic body, and that gets a lot more difficult. And I, I think I mentioned yesterday to someone about, you know, we have a whole uh, discussion going on back in the country about spiritual heritage how to sustain your spiritual heritage. And that I think when you talk about these sacred sites and its association to the people and the custodians, some of them being from the monastic institutions, I think that's when things get a lot more tricky and it uh, gets uh, to a point that it sometimes uh, you just have the time take a toll on these kind of situation. So that um, I totally agree with you. and. Uh, how to deal with it, I think, like I said, I think the time will deal out of it. On the Wangdi, yes, and I think um, I also have an answer that is yes, I agree with you. We are doing interventions that uh, may be heavily criticized uh, with that it is not something that you can remove very easily. Like I said, we already had to make many papers. But I feel that we have made interventions that also respects the craftsmanship. So in this particular project, uh, we employ over 300 uh, workers, 50% uh, um, of them being skilled craftsmen, and they are all working together in this project. Because one of our insistence, and I think that came from the experts' uh, recommendation also, that we do not exclude the traditional craftsmen out of the work that we're doing. It is only for these some of the intervention measures only that we have had no choice but to look out for help. But uh, when we work with the rest of the structure, it is further refining what we know. So I think that integration is very much there. So I think that is not something that I would worry. But yes, how the um, the acceptance level, how they would see it, would they eventually the the enthusiasm to rebuild and rec uh, you know renewal. Would that spirit die down in the process? Because now it gets a lot more tedious. It was never s simple. But again, to counteract to that, um, for the ones who have gone to Bhutan, I think there's a very important uh, ruin in Paro. It's uh, uh, frequented by many of the tourists. This had got. This was a zong burnt in 1950s. Again, fire accident. And ever since that, it always remained in ruin. And now again. The government, because we are taking up much too, intervention, uh, much too uh, extreme interventions in Wangdi, they have imposed it on us to build that structure without modern interventions. And they want, it, they want us to build as traditional as possible. And even when we place them that some of these uh, traditional uh, way of how things are done, it's very clearly that they are not good. We need to find some solution to it. But even then, um, the government had said no. One zone, you set an example, do your interventions to whatever extent you can. Another zone, side by side, you built it as traditional as possible. And here in this particular zone, the condition is, because in the Wang Di Patong zone, we have a lot of stakeholders. So when we have stakeholders, there's always this negotiation that goes on whenever you put in anything. But in this Drugel zone that we're doing, 
we, we don't have stakeholder. So nobody says, the, the clear instruction is you get this reconstructed as traditional as possible. There's no function being given because now that this was abandoned for the last over 50 years, the usage has been kind of stopped. So it's neither administrative, it's neither monastic. So therefore, there's no function. So we, the, it's a nightmare for the, the architects because when you don't have a function, you don't have a guide of what are you expecting? How many, where wet spaces are, where, should you have toilets in the spaces? Should you um, provide something? So because when you don't have a function, it's really crazy to work. So um, that's another parallel project we're going, which I didn't, of course, mention because I think even for us, we're having a little difficult time digesting some of the things that we're doing. But this is how the government wants us at this moment. We built that structure with the base isolation of the similar kind, but one story lesser. We built it in six months, and that was a record history without intervention. And uh, I, I don't think we've, anyone's ever done that, but with traditional skills, we did it in record six months because we had to have it completed to commemorate an important day. And uh, now how that fares uh, to external factors is yet to be seen. So again, um, I, I've already gone under a lot of criticism by some of the experts who visited back. Uh, Galmarni was there recently. And the first thing he walks into my office is, what the hell did you do with line? <laughs> Six months, you shouldn't have taken that risk. But I had no choice, but that, that, that was some of the intervention. So I hope, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's a situation, and I think what you raised, absolutely, I, I'm totally with you. But I think how we progress, I think only time will tell us for now. Thank you. I think we'll have, we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. If there are, yes, please, Mrs. Yeah. Gitanj. There's a uh, mic that will be available. Yes, to be sustainable. Um, um, well, uh, Bhutan is very good with that because uh, in our constitution, constitution in itself, we say that we must maintain a minimum forest cover of 60%. At this moment, we have a 70% forest cover at this moment. Because you, we use extensively timber, um, the replant, reforestation is something that is an important uh, uh, an, an, an important activity back in a country so um, now the projects have started to um, take in large area of the uh, an abandoned forest or uh, area that has no plantation so we have started to patronize these sites so that uh, there's another agency under the department of forest and park services uh, it is called the green bhutan their job is to do replantation. So we kind of, now each monument is going to be um, taking care of a certain area. So they plant trees, and we hope that these trees, once they grow, they can be reused. So this cycle will continue. In the rural areas, we have what we call the community forest. So these forests are earmarked as community. They maintain it. And we have a system when you build a rural home, each household gets certain amount of tree, which you have to fell it from this community. And it must be a joint discussion that goes on on who gets it, who deserves it. It is not like, uh, because I, I have the wealth, if I decide to build four houses back in my village, it's not that I get timber for four. So that system is very good because of, uh, again, the credit goes to our fourth king, who's been very wise to uh, put in institute such system that is there in the country. I hope that answers. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I think uh, just as we speak, 
this today, yes, uh, yesterday evening there was a forest fire. We do have major forest fire every year. I think that's a, a problem that we have not been able to address. But because it gets very dry in winter, everything is so tinder dry that it catches very flammable. But we cannot use anything different because in that altitude, I think the the if we what we've realized from our experiments is when we use conifer in uh, conifer tree uh, timber in the area where conifers are grown they fare well because then there's a less problem of insects uh, or of course humidity and all that issues it's the problem starts when you start taking conifer from uh, um, a temperate region to a tropical down in the south then that's when the problem happens similarly even hardwood that we take from the tropical region up to a, a a much higher altitude that becomes a big problem as well so i think we look at it in that context but um it's been something that has happened like i, I as you were mentioning we're so ac accustomed to these kind of forest fires mitigating them uh, using pine that is readily available replanting them that that seems to be the only solution if we were to introduce any new species again it would bring a lot of imbalance in the ecology so again that's another issue that the forest uh, um, impose on us over the time i uh, could you shed some light on the kind of uh, guidelines that the government has set for new commercial and residential buildings like how Bhutanese is, uh, does our, the architecture have to be? Mm. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's a very good question because, again, we had a guideline uh, that came out in the late 1990s. It was the traditional architectural guidelines meant for new construction in the country. And they, um, they, they were very strict about what kind of um, element, architectural elements needed to be at which point of which stages of the building. Um, that ended up being a little disastrous because um, there was no flexibility for the architects to design because if on first floor you had to put the cornices, on the second floor you had to put the two layer cornices. So that kind of really restricted uh, the creativity out of the architect. And in the end, the building started to look very similar and fairly ugly in its form as well. So then, very recently, uh, this was, I think, four years back, we decided to kind of shelf that guideline. And then uh, we decided to reintroduce the uh, why some of the elements exist. The elements had its functional reasons for being there. It had its own um, structural reasons for being there. So we were trying to explain that in a much more coherent way why these architectural elements traditionally existed in a traditional building. Now, if we were to use them back into a modern buildings, then we provided different options of how you could, you know, mix them and, you know, w which to what extent could you mix them? You know, you don't make a khichiri out of it, but you do it in such a way that it makes sense. So we have now, if you look up in the uh, the Works in Human Settlement, it's called the, it's like the PWD here, website, you can find that guideline. So it, it's a fairly now, uh, like I said, it's the, 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 the guidelines are now about reasoning why it exists. So therefore, if you are going to be using it, you need to use it correctly. So that if you if you are not using it, then somebody, an authority responsible, can point to you that this is not done. Gives a lot more room of flexibility to the designer, as well as we've started to see much more uh, better buildings in this process. Earthquakes, how? 
We, we actually, um, it was built exactly the way it was, it used to be. Uh, the, um, I think reconstruction was not a major issue then. Um, extensions and additions were also not an issue. And I think as pointed out uh, by Madam Olya, I think this uh, Eurocentric kind of a philosophy kind of got into the government. And then that's when the questioning started happening. So therefore, this is where I was citing the example of the reconstruction of a particular another zone using the same technique that you use, we used to use, just to give a comparison on how we would react to it. My question actually, uh, I think Okay. Uh, because whenever uh, traditional wisdom works towards construction, yes. you always try to uh, address a particular problem that has yes. Mm. You learn from uh, lessons learned, okay. Yes, yes. 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 Your construction methodology in some manner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Since, uh, oh, okay, okay. So I'm sorry you if you I have a, a history of yes, yes, yes. Had any very yes. Here you have a very uninterrupted. Yes. No, actually, um, uh, if I got your question correctly, um, although documented, but uh, they are documented through generations of people. So. If one generation had experienced a disaster, it, it was not that within that same generation another disaster could happen that they could try to improve on it. Uh, if if um, I didn't mention it very clearly, but the last big earthquake that we had was in the um, uh, in the eighteen uh, the nineteenth end of the nineteenth century. That was the biggest earthquake recorded. And we have many of our written documents mentioning about how that earthquake damaged many of the structures in the country. Um, then, of course, a lot of reconstruction happened, as you mentioned, and they were done um, fairly in the same kind of way that they did. But it was only that we got to see after the 19th century, then another earthquake comes only in the end of 20th century. So you see there's a hundred years uh, gap that is coming into picture. Therefore, it's not the same generation experiencing. So when it is not the same gener generation experiencing the same problem over and again, and it's not well documented in the context of a written document, it's more a verbal thing of what they passed on from one to another. So that is what we lack in the country. If we had a good consistency of what was documented, what interventions were made, then we would have been able to know that some worked well and some did not. But now what we are doing at this moment is we are kind of um, undressing the building to understand this stratigraphy of changes that have been coming about. Now, because we talk about living heritage, people are using this building. It's next to impossible to ask the house and say, can I take a core sample from your house? They really don't like it. So which are the houses that we study on? These are the abandoned houses that are there, which are in ruin form. We make our studies from there. Um, the buildings that got affected by the earthquake gave us a good opportunity to study in layers how things were done. But again, Bhutan, with its rugged uh, geographical um, um, uh, setting that we have, one region is very different from the other region. So it's very difficult to carry over one experience to another to understand. We also then understand that craftsmen were not very mobile at that time, that they were taking experiences from one region to another. So that if the earthquake in 2009 was in the eastern part, which is a whole different stock of uh, way of construction that is there, of course, similar material. And the one that we had in 2011 was in the western part, very much rammed earth oriented, very different. Even within this two years difference, we were not able to collect enough information to kind of really understand what were the changes that they experienced after another a disaster and how would they address it. So this is why I think many of the experts say that 
you know, Bhutan should have another earthquake anytime soon. This is what has been predicted. So, uh, because Nepal just experienced uh, two years back, and now they're saying Bhutan is up for it because it's after a hundred years then that it is supposed to come back. But um, I don't know um, if we do have a big earthquake. I think, like I said, with the last two s small earthquakes that we experienced, uh, it's really it was really difficult to document what were the changes they made and did they fare well. There are some, of course, pocket of uh, findings that we have, but they're not good enough to really extrapolate and say, yes, this is what worked and this is what uh, uh, the traditional craftsmen were good at. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Thank you. Very unfortunate, but I have to leave it there. It's, it's half past seven and we've had two wonderful hours of uh, listening to this Bhutanese experience and the exchange that we've had. Uh, I would like to call upon one of our regular visitors to this, to this program, probably the senior most who's sitting here, uh, Mrs. Kamakshi Subramaniam, who, who has always come when we have these lectures at IIT Madras. She's a heritage warrior who lives in the neighborhood of Besanaga and represents so much what heritage is for us. I uh, request Mrs. Kamashi Subramaniam to hand over the memento, thanking Mrs. Ms. Natshri Dorji for uh, coming all the way from Timpu for this Fifth annual lecture, fifth annual lecture uh, on conservation and safety of heritage structures. Yes, please. We've come to the end of the fifth annual lecture. We look forward to the sixth annual lecture. Uh, I thank each one of you for taking time off this evening to come all the way to IIT Madras and uh, join us for this collaboration that we've started in this uh, public lecture. So thank you. I personally thank uh, each one of you uh, and look forward to working with all of you again. Thank you so much. <laughs>